I just, I just want this to be awkward, just how weird it is right now. Hey guys, how are you? There's actually people out there. I got the house lights on. How you going? Somebody asked me if I was gonna walk out to Easy Lover like I did at a recent conference. And I was like, uh, yeah, for sure. But also, I'm just gonna let it keep playing as I walk down here. So the crowd is so quiet. Hey guys, hey, this is great. Everyone's like, what is this? Is this a part of the show? This is in my presenter notes. I'm gonna go across the middle now. Just, hey, let's dance guys. Everybody stand up and dance with me. I'm being dead serious. Awkwardly dance. This is the most fun I've had today. I've been at a booth. I've been running numbers and reports. Good to see you guys. Thanks for doing this. This is really fun. This whole row is down still. Good to see you guys. Mouth drums, yeah. Mouth drums, yeah. I haven't tripped yet. Not one time. I told you I was going to tell you when to let it stop, but you can't let this song stop. <sighs> All right, you can stop it now. First slide. <laughs> that song, everyone thinks it's Phil Collins, but it's actually Philip Bailey featuring Phil Collins. Philip Bailey is the lead singer of Earth, Wind, and Fire. You guys know that one? Reasons! That's my favorite band of all time, and it sounds like I'm being sarcastic. I am not. It's my favorite. But Oh, the slide's up. Thank you guys for seeing my talk. I can barely see you. I think I saw people stand up there and dance. Um, so we're going to kick into this thing. Who's this bro? He kind of looks like Macaulay Culkin. I get that one a lot. Um, I get pretty much every standard white guy in entertainment. Um, but I want to tell you guys a little bit about myself and what I'm up to. Um, this is my wife and kid. The guitar was not planned. That really seemed like it was planned. Um, she's so adorable. That's her in her breakfast nook. I'm kind of obsessed with her right now. She's so cute. Those are my shoes. If you guys like them. Right now she has the hair of Jeff Daniels from Dumb and Dumber. It's better though, earlier it was looking like Nick Nolte, the mugshot, which I don't have a photo of. This is my dog, Captain. Dude, he kills me too. Uh, I originally, I didn't really want a dog, but then I got one because my wife was just like, we need a dog and if I, if I was single, I would have a dog. And so then we got Captain, <laughs> and I love him so much that I have a tattoo of him. And he, I, he does not have a tattoo of me yet, but he will. This is the office space that I work in. I work with other creatives. Built this thing out. It's pretty, it's about two miles away from my house. I work there with a couple photographers and a couple entrepreneurs. Uh, we did this, we rebuilt it and then put wainscoting on the walls. It's just like this wood paneling. Here's another shot of that. <laughs> this is so lowbrow. <laughs> I saw like uh, uh, th Thoreau quotes on the previous t <laughs> presentation, and you guys just saw that. So uh, this is the bathroom. We do like little portraits there. That's back when Rooney looked like an adorable um, Woody Harrelson. Um, I help run an event series called Connecting Things. I run that with the hoods, the twins. I say I run it, they, they do all the work. And then we have like six other partners and we're constantly just complaining about how we're not helping enough, but the hoods are doing it all. And then uh, in Southern California, I like to surf and I like to snowboard, um, but I had to take a break from that because I also like motorcycles, I'm sure, very dangerous. Which is a PSA to anyone who does that. Um, what's he done? Uh, but he designed the Home Alone post. I forgot that I actually put that joke in there. I'm a freelance illustrator designer, so here's some of my work. You guys might be familiar with that one. It became a cultural uh, phenomenon for me. It was kind of surreal. We didn't really know that this project was going to be so big. Um, they did an awesome job marketing it and doing the product photography for it. Uh, but I only take so much credit for this one because um, 
I didn't write the story Star Wars. I know it's, <laughs> I know that that might surprise some of you. Uh, here's the dark side. Uh, my favorite character though is Lando. Look how happy Lando looks. He's like, he's like, what's up? And then we have Han in Carbonite, and that one took a really long time. Part of the difficulty with di designing a sock like that is humans are not tubes, which is true. So you, the proportions are always weird, but it's kind of fun. It's like a puppet. Um, am I racing through this? Are we good on time? So uh, these were ones we did for Comic-Con. Um, this was the most recent ones we did, and they were sort of a three-quarter view. The crazy thing about designing these uh, is that I would start working on them about like a year before they come out, and so like there's all these characters that I've never seen before or, or I'm familiar with, and so um, I have to like, they only send me like two photos, and so they have to like make up, and they're like, yeah, it looks nothing like him, and I'm like, well, no, duh, I can't see the other side of his face. So, uh, the, Justin Trudeau has one of these things. Two very important things. Like, what? This is completely irresponsible. <laughs> Should be wearing a solid color. He's done it twice. Um, you guys are such a good crowd already. I was so nervous back there when Philip Bailey started playing. So, this is uh, The Rock. Are you guys familiar with The Rock? And then Clay, Clay who plays for the um, Golden State Evil Empire. <laughs> and he's a sweetheart. Uh, I've also done other socks that are not Star Wars. I've done lots of, my career is just, I have a lot of sock money, you guys. Um, so I did <laughs> these uh, camo, digital camo uh, wrapping. Uh, it's kind of funny when they get like knitted like that because their faces change a little bit. So it's already imperfect, my illustration. And then they just get kind of a little wonky. And then when you put them on your leg, <laughs> they get even funnier looking. And so I did uh, James Harden. I did the brow. I did <laughs> the king. And I did the other evil empire <laughs> player. Um, and... Uh, I've also designed a uh, helmet for a, an Olympic athlete, a Rebel helmet. This was one of the first projects I did as a freelancer. He wore this thing for, for many seasons. He's from Indiana. That's Nick Gepper. You guys know Nick Gepper? Someone, is Nick Gepper here? <laughs> uh, there's a Formula One character because Indiana has Formula One and corn and basketball. And that's the only things I know about Indiana. Um, here's the other side of it. I used to work for Nike for about four years. Um, I did a lot of t-shirts, hats, board shorts, prints. We call in the business printables, which is not a known term. And we used to call this product design. Believe it or not, kids, product design used to be physical products. We lost that one to the UI guys. Here's some more illustration. <laughs> um, there's a wave. That one was for Nike 6.0. This one for... Uh, Nike women's sportswear. This aggressive ass eagle is for a woman's tee. Um, I've also done uh, work for ESPN. Um, and shout out to Titus. We got this uh, project where we do custom shoes. Uh, Von Miller's like one of my favorite football players, my favorite footballers. And he's from Texas and he's just kind of a loud dude. He's got a really cool style. This was the print that I did for that and then it got locked into the shoe. I did one for Antonio Brown. Um, and they were like, they love these two. And they were like, okay, let's do a third one. Just I was only supposed to do one, I think. And then I did this clay. <laughs> Clay Matthews one. What's up? Funny thing about this one is um like that's like full like romance novel because he has just like amazing hair. But uh uh I had my friend pose for it, like in the office. <laughs> the dogs were there too, but the he was posed and I like drew, I took a picture and I drew over top of it. Also I do all these illustrations for Kook Slams, which is a ridiculous Instagram that you should find you should find and follow. Uh, and we did these skate decks, uh, and they're all really funny and just ridiculous about falling in the ocean. <laughs> just There's a term called a kook, and a kook is a person who is not good at water sports, but wants to do them. 
And it's a totally derogatory term, which you should never call someone, but that's what that's about. I also run a t-shirt apparel brand called Chomp. This is a tiny little, anyone visit the Chomp table? <laughs> I mean, it's crazy that so many of you guys would come to a kissing booth, but I just, all of you guys made it by. And I also arm wrestled somebody for stickers. This guy, where is he? And I think I lost badly. He was like him like arm wrestling a toddler. And he um, like put my arm down really fast. And he's clearly doping. So <laughs> I don't have a video of that. Um, so those are the sticker packs. We have stickers. We have teas. Please come and just see me before we, we shut it down in a few hours. Um, and uh, there's a subliminal message there. OK, so I thought I could talk to you guys about um, a lot of things, things that would make me look really good. Um, I just went through my portfolio because I'm about to completely besmirch my reputation as a designer illustrator worn by Justin Trudeau. So uh, I'm calling this one Fears, Failures, Fuck-Ups, and Fortune. I'll try not to say that I've heard that much. The Misadventures of a Freelance Designer. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few stories that are hilarious. And so feel free to laugh at them. And they're, uh, I just put a collection of about five stories together, and I think that you'll like them. So this one's called Breaking Sad. Any Breaking Bad fans out there? <laughs> Love the show. Just like many of you, I was binge watching it on Netflix to an irresponsible hour. Um, and I was obsessed with the show. Subsequently, I was also working at Nike at this time. I. Um, but it, later in the season, when Jesse Pinkman stops dressing like he's really into Limp Bizkit, he wears this t-shirt, which is a t-shirt that I did. And <laughs> Nike 6.0. Um, yeah, thanks for the clap. And so uh, he's kind of dressed like me right now. Actually, he's another white guy I get told I look like. <laughs> <laughs> so during this time, I would, uh, I would be obsessed with the show. So during my lunch break at Nike, uh, which is a good job. I wasn't necessarily upset about working at this job, but I just loved the show so much that I drew the characters. And I would take about an hour to draw the characters uh, at lunchtime. And so it was just enough time so that I could draw it and then put it on my Instagram. This was like really early days of Instagram because um, it was like the first time I got 100 likes. And um, I never, I'm not like super Instagram guy, but, uh, but it just meant a lot to me at that time. It was cool people were engaging with your artwork. Before that, it was like pictures of the sky, <laughs> pictures of your brunch. And so then I drew the rest of the uh, crew and um, I, I, I spoiled the show. Well, now I'm spoiling it for anyone who hasn't seen it. But Gus, uh, I drew Gus and, that, and then Mike is actually my favorite because his head is just perfectly shaped. I watched the show and just want to rub it. So I would post these things on the internet, and um, and people would interact with them, and we get pinned. And there was a ton of fan art around the show, like just an unreasonable amount of fan art. Um, and so the show ended, or was coming to a close, and uh, so was my artwork. Um, except that one day, I got a call from AMC. And so it wasn't a phone call, because no one actually calls anyone anymore. But uh, they were like, hey, we're putting a book together for the cast and crew. And uh, we want you to be in it. We want you to be the head of every chapter. So we need you to finish all the illustrations. But then we want to license your art. But we're not going to sell it. We're just going to give it to your idols. <laughs> and I was like, fuck yeah. So I do the book. And, uh, and there's a bunch of other artists in here. There's a bunch of really talented illustrators and artists who are also dork fans like me. And um, so these things show up in the book. And the book gets to my house in this beautiful package. Um, and the packaging is just, it's, it's a huge package. It has a bow on the outside. And then I open it up, it has this like blue paper that looks like blue meth. And then they send me, they send me the book and they get a card in there. I open the card, card's like, hey, um, thank you so much for giving your art. Here's a book and hope you enjoy the blue meth. And I was like, oh, that's great. It is blue paper. And then I looked on Instagram after I'd thrown away the box and someone, one of the other artists was holding this little baggie in their hand. And all of it came to a wow. I threw away the blue meth. There was blue meth in my box. The blue meth from the show 
that I love so much that is definitely not going to make more blue meth and I'm not going to be able to buy this stuff and it went in the garbage. So what's the lesson here? Read shit. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's Instagramming this quote, like there's other people who are like this, the famous person once said, read shit. Um, next story. Uh, those tees are fire. So I told you guys I work at Nike and um, I designed lots and lots of t-shirts. Here's one that's made out of shoes. It's a skull. Here's some women's sportswear that I did with the aggressive eagle. And when you make as many t-shirts as I do, Clark and I, Clark Orr and I were talking about this, about how many t-shirts we actually think we've made. And like, we were just being totally candid. And I was like, maybe a thousand different t-shirts. This is like how I, and now socks are coming up pretty quick. So we'll get to a thousand socks. But when you make that many t-shirts, you put so many things on them, you run out of ideas. But a big thing that we would always do at Nike is we would take the Futura font and we would put it on t-shirts in different type or different words on it. And I wrote this beautiful saying. 1972 to forever. You didn't misread that. Well, I misread it because actually the rep missed it, I missed it, the merchandiser missed it, the buyer missed it. <laughs> oh yeah, I think you know where this is going. 1500 T's. <laughs> what? Okay, in fairness, they didn't go to retail. They just were printed and tagged and polybagged and boxed. <laughs> you can't get one. And the reason why is because if we had put those in the marketplace, it would have been memed right away and we would have all been embarrassed by it. So what does Nike do? <laughs> what does any apparel company do when they don't want a hazard, PR hazard like that? They incinerate them. And if you don't know what that word means, it means on fire. 1,500 T's completely burnt. And what's the lesson there? Well, actually, it's just spell check. <laughs> Get it? It's the logo. And I should have spelled it like just Dorit or something dumber. But um, I didn't get fired because uh, uh, I was doing a good job in other areas. So there was a bit of redemption there. And really, around that same time, I had also designed hats that were not misspelled, that were the best sellers at that time for the category in that retailer. Thank God I wasn't fired. So that's that story right there. Uh, till you have 1,500 T's set on fire, don't complain. So, okay, the brand blunder. This story is really good. So you guys know I run Chomp now. You know that I arm wrestle people for stickers. Um, but... Uh, around the time that I was starting Chomp, uh, I was coming up with the idea for it. I, there was a lot of things, and just picture this. Mumford & Sons is the most popular band at this time. Reclaimed Wood is everywhere. <laughs> Everyone's doing Wanderlust, whatever that means. And so in my free time, I would sort of like poke fun at these types of uh, marketing schemes. I would... <laughs> <laughs> that, that, uh, you can see how the small one says, purveyors of handmade quality things that white people like. Um, <laughs> I guess you could say I was bored with brands. Um, so I was also drawing other stuff around this time, things that I just thought were sillier. I really liked um, a lot of the brands of yesteryear, Santa Cruz Skateboards, Stussy, uh, fresh Jive, stuff from the 90s, things that are bright. And I was talking to a friend who's a buyer at a major retailer, and he said, yo, you should start a brand. And I was like, that sounds stupid. And then he was like, I would buy teeth from it. And I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, was looking back at the 90s. <laughs> I love this image so much. Like how, this guy has made... My every movie good. 
For some, Bad Boys 2, I think, is the best movie ever made. I wasn't really turned on to Bad Boys 2 until my, my friend Sean, who was uh, my best friend who's at the vendor, he was like, dude, you need to watch Bad Boys 2. I know it sounds ridiculous, but this is really one of the best movies ever made. And I can confirm. <laughs> Uh, so we were working on this like cut paper stuff that we think is really cool, and uh, we came up with this photo style that we thought would be really nice. And um, this was actually an outtake from the photo because we were going to show products holding teas like this. We thought it was really cool. This is a few years ago, and so we launched the brand, and we launch it with Zoomies, who's our major retailer. It's such a great partner, but Zoomies has a huge audience. And Chomp at this time has no audience. Has like me, and like my mom, <laughs> like my mom's small group, <laughs> whoever get the word out with. And, uh, and so because we have no followers, we have no comments, but we got our first Instagram comment, which I thought was a really sweet sentiment. And it said this, yo, these things fucking suck, LOL. <laughs> Good, a good comment. This nice young man, <laughs> early fan of the brand, he uh, said that to us. And I was devastated. I blocked him right away. <laughs> <laughs> I was not going to try and make this kid a believer. But I really regret that right now because I feel that it's the best slogan for our brand. So actually, it is the slogan for our brand. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are re a really responsive crowd. I think Philip Bailey turned this whole thing into a party. So that was our first Instagram comment. I really regret deleting it. I wish I would have screenshotted it. Some people don't believe it was our first comment. It was 100% our first comment. And then three years later, or re excuse me, rather around this, this exact time where I was completely devastated by being told my tees suck LOL, was a t-shirt magazine posted this about us, five brands killing it this year. Uh, I had never heard of t-shirt magazine, but they really liked us and they were very sweet about it. And it gave me, I didn't want to jump off a bridge. So subsequently since then, three years later, there's this many people who have chomp tattoos. Actually, it's more than this. I just got one sent today, and some of the photos are, are sent to me are not that great, but there's people putting my artwork on their bodies. Like, that's insane. I didn't expect or set out to do this. I Maybe someone will tattoo my face on them at some point, but for now, this is something really, really great, and so the lesson here is to stick with it. Um, it's really easy to, like, when you start something or do something new, to have like a devastating thing like that happen that will just hurt you and you just like don't want to move forward or you take it as a sign that like you shouldn't keep going. But you really don't know what something's going to become early on. Um, so I'm going to challenge you to stick with it. And just to help you guys along, I'm going to also comment then on all you guys' Instagrams, that exact sentiment. That would be, hor be horrible. Okay, anyways, next story. CMO, no. So if you're familiar with my work, one of my favorite clients of all time is Taco Bell. Um, the, um, dude, Taco Bell fans in here. I, can't, I, I realized when I was working that I have a Taco Bell in there, my threshold for how much Taco Bell I'm willing to eat and give my body to science is like a lot. <laughs> I, every day I was there, I was like, you know what? Today, we'll just keep it mellow. We will not get nacho fries. And every day I got nacho fries. So we worked on this franchisee event called Forum. And Forum is a, is a really cool event. And um, they... Uh, let me do all the artwork for the inside of it. And this is what it turned like. So it was projection mapped on the wall, and it was Art Deco. Um, and there's like little objects hidden there, tacos, uh, crunch wraps. This is for nacho fries. You get it? There's some fries in there. Um, and these things turned out really great. These people are so good to me. I love this client so much. And um, when I was working on this, um, I uh, 
have my headphones in. I was just jamming. And I usually don't work on site with people. I usually just work in my office with the wainscoting. But the, <laughs> um, so I'm working on, and I'm like on task. I'm like, don't mess up. Don't pull up Twitter to look at it. Just focus. And this lady walks up to me. And she taps on my shoulder, and she tells me to pull my ear he headphones out, and she says this to me, I love what you're working on. I was like, that's really nice, lady. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, then I put my headphones back on, not opening Twitter, continuing to work. And um, this other gentleman who's hiring me walks over to me, and he says, hey, do you know who that was? And I was like, "What? who was that? He's like, that's the CMO. And I was like, what does CMO stand for? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, that's the chief marketing officer. That's the most important person who could totally fire you. And I was like, what? <laughs> oh, snap. Uh, because I was redemptive. Because as you know how much I love Philip Bailey, I was playing office DJ on the previous visit there. And uh, the music was a bit loud, and someone walked over me, tapped me on the shoulder, headphone, or excuse me, I didn't have headphones in because I was playing music very loud, and they said, uh, could you please turn down the music? You're interrupting the CMO. <laughs> <laughs> What's the lesson there? I actually have no clue. I just thought it was a funny story. <laughs> like, just playing music so loud that you're interrupting everyone else's, like, meetings and the most important person <laughs> in the room. <laughs> so... Um, this uh, next story called Tastemaker. So uh, I've been freelancing for about five years. I get a phone call from a friend, and he's like, yo, I have a dream project. And so I was thinking, like, I was, like, actually thinking about this type of packaging that I wanted to do. And uh, then I got a project, and he came through. He's like, uh, will you take it? And I was like, heck, yeah, I've been wanting to put this kind of thing in my portfolio. And he's like... Here's the outline. Here's the brief. Um, can you put together some art direction? We'll get it together, and we'll pitch it to the client. I was actually on the road traveling, so I wasn't going to be able to be in that meeting. So I, but I hop on the phone. We do the client call. Give him uh, five ideas, five directions. And uh, he interrupts me in the beginning to let me know, I know good design. <laughs> so I felt just a little bit like it was like when I was at the car mechanic, and the guy's like, just so you know, your alternator, your starter, your spark plugs, and your mover are all bad. And I'm like, I am a car guy. <laughs> You're not going to get one past me, buddy. But the truth is, I don't know anything about cars. And so that's how I, I took that sentiment. It was a big deal. You know, people say lots of things in meetings. Um, and so... The meeting goes good, and it's like I say, after every meeting, I say, thanks for the work. It's insane that anyone trusts me to like design for their brand um, and give me money to do it, to like take risks. And so that's why I say, thanks for the work. But you know what he said to me? He said, I won't say you're welcome until I see something I like. <laughs> Which is like a veiled threat. <laughs> This is the first time I ever felt, uh, usually it's like when someone's hiring your like, your teammates, you know? It's like we're working together, we want to come with a solution. No reason to be at odds with each other. I took it as a flag, but I didn't want to do self-fulfilling prophecy, and I wanted to um, deliver on good work. And honestly, this project is really cool. And so I deliver 10 comps, and the client hates them all. Um which I saw coming. <laughs> uh, I was ignoring my better judgment here and continued to ignore my better judgment when I delivered 10 more comps. Um, I was substantiating this work with other designers at this time. But it's just something I do now later in my career. I send stuff to the hoods a lot. I show it to my dog, Captain. And people usually give me feedback, and it's, uh, I, I try to have a very concise feedback. But after I deliver these 10 comps, uh, client calls to fire us. This is the first time I've been fired in five years on a project. And uh, what I realized shortly after was, it's good to get fired. <laughs> there's, a re there's lots of reasons why I'm saying that here. Primary one was I was ignoring all of my regular impulses of checks and balances that 
uh, no matter how well I was going to do on this project, there would be a little bit of friction the entire way. Part of that is just like designers speaking different languages than clients and there being um, some language barrier, but I wanted to assure you that sometimes it is good to get fired and sometimes the hassle might not be worth it. And even though you're getting fired, uh, there's always new opportunities. And so I wanted to go through a list of just real quick other notable fails, <laughs> failures and fuck ups. Uh, I was escorted out of my office by security, my client's office by security card for a tweet that I made. Now, this was a funny, jokey tweet, but <laughs> one day when I can tell the story, you will all laugh. <laughs> 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 I can't even believe I told you guys that one. I was devastated. We we did two more projects together after this. It was not a thing, but it was it was surprising at the moment. Um, and uh, some guy at Nike nicknamed me Hollister without me knowing. <laughs> this guy laughed so hard. I, <laughs> this is the sickest burn in the entirety of all the nicknames I've been called. I've been called horrible names too. And um, one time uh, during like a meet and greet for an event, um, somebody told me my brand looks like it's for dads. <laughs> I was like devastated, but also confused <laughs> as a dad. <laughs> <laughs> Did something happen all the time, all of a sudden where I want to wear cargo shorts and a visor, <laughs> grow a soul patch. Um, dress for comfort is really what I'm saying here, but I told my friend, I was devastated by it, and then he was like, a friend, my friend told me, it looks like it's for little kids, actually. <laughs> Ironically, it looks like it's for little kids. He thought that was like gonna make, he said, that person's so wrong, buddy. <laughs> looks like it's for little kids. <laughs> I just embarrassed myself in front of all of you. Remember the socks, people? Okay, in conclusion. Uh, and what I wanted to say was, it's okay to blow it. I mean, I'd give a long paragraph here, but I just wanted to tell you and remind you, it's okay to blow it. I've had a 12-year career. I've blown it lots of times, some not as funny or interesting to put in a slide deck. Um, but I'm sure you guys have blown it. And I just wanted to remind you, when you get to that point where it's ridiculous or embarrassing, um, and the stakes seem high, that it's okay to blow it. And I want to say thank you. And then I want to also say, follow me on the internet. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Good work, sir. Uh, we've got time for two or three questions with our friend Josh. Uh, any questions out there? Any questions from our friends? Yes. can't go into detail on that one, but, oh, you know, obviously, you know my work now, so you know that I, I try to design for lots of industries and lots of different types of things, and so um, even though I think that the work that I'm making is very good, a lot of times the client relationship is different from project to project, and it takes a certain way of, like, thought pattern to kind of wrangle the client and educate the client. And I think I just, in that instance, wasn't doing a good enough job or being clear enough on the value of what I was creating for them and um, or that I wasn't being given the opportunities to say that. So um, it was a lesson there in that. We're looking at you, Barney and friends. Um, wow. What was that reference? That was, that, that was a Barney <laughs> reference from like when I was three. I no don't know, one got it's it. the end what? of the day, and I'm like yeah. about 10% here. But we're here now Good. together. Uh, let's get one more question for Josh. And by one, I mean two. I saw a hand. This guy, gentleman, right here. Yes. Over there. Yes. Uh, how long did, was my design time? Um, 
His question is, how long does it take and what's your process for designing t-shirts? Hmm. It didn't take very long to misspell Fovever. <laughs> it's just a really broad, the broad answer is that I just, we art direct and then we put content in there that we think is really good. So it would be like, um, this gentleman's wearing an avocado shirt. The art direction there is that we want a, fl like a summary print and we know that we want avocado in there. <laughs> and they made an avocado shirt. So the content could be kind of switched out sometimes and then, uh, and so that's the, that's the meat of it. I mean, it's always like, it's, it's just like everything. Art direction is, is the thing that you're trying to nail down and you want to just form fit that to whatever the, the client's request is. And so it doesn't take me long to misspell a word, but sometimes to draw a really big eagle, it could take a long time. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, Liz. Hi, Liz. Here's the mic again. So I went my entire life until like two weeks ago when I was in Cleveland and I went to the cantina never having Taco Bell. So I had my, I just had my first Taco Bell experience. That's important. This is like being baptized. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, we have Taco Bell in Canada. I just, for some reason, it doesn't matter. I just, I just want to know, like, I am going to go again because I've been converted into the church of Taco Bell. Next time I go, what should I get? Okay, if it's breakfast, a breakfast crunch wrap is out of this world. <laughs> it rivals any Newport Beach brunch that you could pay and get mimosas. Very inexpensive. And it's better if you can sneak in a mimosa. I don't know that, oh, they do. They actually serve alcohol at the cantina. She knows. You heard Taco that, right? Bell goes hard. I don't know their hours. Open early. So um, uh, that would be my recommended. Breakfast Crunch Up is the jam. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. Let's give Josh a hand. Thank you. Listen to Philip Bailey.